Hi, everybody. Just sitting down. Uh, many of you asked that I invite this lovely gentleman on the show, and we listened. Maxime Bernier, welcome on the show. Thanks for the invitation. I'm very pleased to be with you. Likewise. We, we I was looking for that. Uh, likewise. <laughs> we had a chance to sit down for a coffee before we get to know each other. It's always yeah. nice to break the ice. And uh, the rumors that you are a charming guy are true indeed. <laughs> he is a charming guy. So there's so much for us to cover. Um, I thought first I would just mention, or you could introduce your political history, just your bio so that people get a sense of who you are, where you're coming from politically? Yes, thanks for asking. First of all, as you may know, I worked um, 20 years in Montreal here in the financial sector before being in politics. And I jumped into politics in 2006 to fight for uh, limited government, more freedom and free markets. And as you may know, uh, in uh, August last year, I decided to uh, quit the Conservative Party of Canada. Uh, because they didn't want to speak about the real issues for our country. And we created the People's Party of Canada the September the 14th, so it will be a year and a couple of days. And I think it's my best time in politics right now. I'm speaking about the real issues and without any political correctness. Uh, and I think people appreciate that. So I'm not a, a real politician on that sense. Uh, because you speak your mind. Yeah, and, and that can be maybe risky. Right. But, you know, uh, I'm taking these uh, risks, and uh, I like to speak about ideas and based on principle. So right. I like to call our, our party, the People's Party of Canada, the principle alternative. We have four principles, individual freedom, personal responsibility, respect, and fairness. And all our policies are in line with these principles. So we're very different than the other political parties on that. And historically, you, so you've been a member of parliament since 2006. You represent the district uh, both in, of both in Quebec. Yeah. You're obviously bilingual, certainly more than many politicians. You speak beautiful English. <laughs> well, I I'm, I'm still have an accent. <laughs> you still have an accent, but that's okay. Well, if you don't learn a language before about the age of 12, there's something that happens by about 12. So that I came to Canada when I was 11, so I learned English before that magical yeah. period, so I could speak it, I think, without an accent. Had I come a year or two earlier, I might be speaking like you. <laughs> but but that, that's why, uh, you know, I have two daughters, uh, 17 and 20, and uh, they're perfectly bilingual. They, they went to uh, English uh, school when they were young, and that was important right. for me as a, a francophone. Uh, I wanted my uh, daughters to be able to speak English and French without any accent, and uh, you know I'm proud of that. Do they support your political career? Do they are they excited that Daddy is a big politician? But you know uh, I'm a little bit different than the other uh, politicians. Uh, I don't use uh, my children, and I don't put them in front of right. me. Uh, you know, sometimes you have politicians that will take photo with their family, and no, people are voting for me. And yes, uh, I have two daughters and, and a wife. But uh, for me, I'm the man who's doing politics. They are following that, but they're so busy to study, and, uh, and that's okay. You know, I couldn't agree more because I'm also quite often in the public eye, yeah. and you never see any photos of my wife or children ever. Yeah. I, uh, precisely for the same reasons as you, I made that choice. Uh, any accolades or hate that I receive, it's my choice. Yeah. I don't need to put my children there, so I appreciate that. And you want to also give them their, their privacy, exactly. and that's important. Yeah. So you also. Well, I, th I think they're proud of their dad, uh, and sometimes there's good day when you look at the news, sometimes there's bad days, but that's politics. You know, right. There's up and down. But altogether, I think uh, uh, the time that um, uh, when I started in politics in 2006 and up to now, I think. Uh, it's, it's, it's positive what I try to do, and we'll see what will happen. And you served as in various important ministerial roles, Minister of Foreign Affairs, yeah. Minister of Industry. Yeah. Uh, how, how is the, when you serve in the cabinet, when you're a minister versus as an MP, yeah. what are the parts that are similar versus different? Oh, the big difference is your freedom. <laughs> right. Freedom of speech, because when you're a member uh, of a government as a minister, uh, you have to agree with, if you don't agree, you can speak in the cabinet with our colleagues. But if you don't win the, the, the fight, the argument, yeah. the argument uh, you have to be behind the government. And that's okay. That's the parliamentary system. Uh, but when you are an MP, you have more freedom because you don't uh, engage the government. You, can, you have more freedom to speak about right. uh, the, the principle and your philosophy in line with your party, right. but you have a little bit more freedom. So yes, I really appreciate when I was a minister 
Uh, and also after that, when I resigned and I was an MP for four years, I had more freedom and I started a blog at that time. Uh, and that was a way for me to express uh, my point of view and, and some policies. And I was pushing a little bit the upper government for uh, being more fiscally responsible. We had deficit at that time and I was the, the one. It's a conservative values to be uh, fiscally responsible. So I delivered a lot of speeches when I was MP and not a minister. And it helped me a lot to, to build a foundation, to be known as the, uh, the authentic, uh, fiscal, conservative, libertarian on the economy right. uh, politician. So the, the term libertarian, or as you, I think you say, smart populism, yeah. you, you're using those interchangeably, right? I mean, is that... Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and smart because, you know, we try to appeal to the intelligence of people, like you're doing at the university. You know, you are teaching people and you want, yeah, you want to have some debates. But at the end, it, it is important to believe in something right. and, and fighting for that. And so, yes, as a politician, I'm fighting for more freedom, for less government, for free speech. And we have a lot of policies on our website. But the most important is to believe in something. Right. Some politicians, you know, they're looking at the polls, they're doing focus group. They don't know what they believe in. And I believe in something. And in my political career, I always try to push for more freedom and less government. So it's, uh, it's, it is why I like what I'm doing right now. You know, we built a new political party based on principle without doing any compromise with our principles. Right. Uh, so I thought we'd drill down now on some issues, but maybe yeah. we could start with one that got you in supposedly some <laughs> hot trouble recently. Uh, you, <clears throat> quote, went after a 16-year-old uh, uh, young woman yeah. who is sort of the, 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 the poster child of the climate activism. Yeah. Uh, tell us about the story and if there's anything that you'd like to correct, if there's yeah. anything to yeah. correct, because I know that when I looked at my Twitter feed, yeah. one of the things that people kept telling me that I should be asking you is, yeah. you know, why is this ogre attacking this helpless <laughs> autistic young woman? So what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, um, I did, I think it was six tweet about uh, her. Uh, she's actually an activist uh, and uh, she's uh, the face of the radical environmentalists. And I know that I, I did uh, speak about her, her personal uh, health and, and but uh, you know she did speak about that personally so she put it out there first all, first for yeah. sure and her parents also and all the radical environmentalists are using that and, and so my mistake was to speak about it instead of being only focused on her message okay. message so that's that was my mistake and i did tweet about that because some people were looking at that oh maxim is attacking uh, all the, uh, the the children that are that are uh, having some mental problems, and, and I said no. You know, uh, I'm, I, I did a mistake to speak about that, and, and I, I correct that. Right. But at the same time, you know, the radical uh, environmentalists are using her because it's so difficult to argue against a child right. uh, and, who has a disability. Who has a disability, and when you do that. You know, it's, it, it's... You're a bully. Oh, absolutely. Right. And, and so, but, you know, it's important because she represents uh, people. When she's saying, you know, I want you to panic. That She said, I want you to panic. I want you to feel my fears that I have every day. Right. Uh, every day. And, and they want us to have a public policy that would be built on, on, on fears. No, it must be built on facts and, and on science. And, and they are saying that and using her. She's the face. She's the, 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 the face of that movement, right. the emergency uh, climate uh, crisis. But for me, there's no emergency climate crisis. And, and we must speak about that. But the fact that they're using her it's very difficult to have a debate. The fact that they're saying, you know, we must act now, there's an emergency. An it, existential emergency. Yeah, right? We absolutely. might not be around in three weeks. Uh, yeah, if we don't do anything, right. it, it will be the end of the world. So they are saying that because, you know, we don't have the right to debate. Right. And they don't want to have any debates. But I'm saying, you know, there's no uh, climate change emergency, and we must be able to debate that. So that's that's important. And I'm the only politician to, to speak about it. So that was easy from the traditional medias to, to go after me about that. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. You, well, you must be responsible of your action. And I said, you know, speaking about her mental health, 
uh, you know, maybe I did a mistake right. and I did correct that. But I'm still very um, focused on the arguments and, and what, sh what she represents. We must fight against that. Right. So I think one strategy that people use is the second that they disagree with you, they find some insult that's supposed to be devastating. So, for example, when it comes to climate issues, you become a science denier. Absolutely. Right? And the idea is that, look, everything, not, not everything is up for debate. Some some things are settled scientific fact. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm certainly not knowledgeable enough to, to, to make a final pronouncement on climate yeah. issues. I haven't read the literature. Yeah. But I think it is certainly worthwhile to be able to discuss how much of climate change is due to man-made action. Yeah. And then it becomes a trade-off of how much are you willing to take from the coffers of a society to reduce some metric by 0.01. Those are perfectly rational conversations to have, and you certainly don't have to be a science denier to say, I'd like to have that conversation. Is that, does that capture your position? You're absolutely right, Gab. You're absolutely right on that. And, and I'm, I'm saying I'm not a scientist. Uh, I don't ask people to believe me. I ask you, you know, go up there and look at what I'm saying and, and, and look at what other scientists are saying also. Uh, you know, Patrick Moore, the ex-founder of, of Greenpeace, Greenpeace. Yeah. Uh, he is a scientist, and he said, you know, human activities, it is not the main, main reason because of the climate change. It is not the main reason why, because what we're having right now with climate change. What is happening right now with the climate? It's always changing, and that's the normality in climate the changing, and the climate is always changing, but the main co cause of climate change, it is not human activities. And I believe that there's other factors, the sun, the ocean, uh, the volcanoes. Uh, it, it's so complicated, and I'm not a scientist, but I'm saying we must debate that. And before imposing new taxes and new regulations on, on Canadians and, and changing our way of life, we must question that and having a debate on that. But for these radical environmentalists like and Elizabeth May and also Mr. Trudeau and Andrew Scheer in their platform, you know, we must fight that. I said, you know, just wait and look at that and having a debate about that. And so that that's our position. Uh, and I will always fight for, for what I believe. What percentage of the climate activism do you think is due to sort of the nefarious, uh, oh, they're trying to redistribute income, you know, so they're socialists trying yeah. to redistribute, versus they're just uh, misinformed virtue signalers, right? Uh, most people are too cognitively lazy to actually dig into the literature to yeah. know what the situation is. But what I know is if I want to show that I'm progressive, then I am a, I'm fully on board with the climate narrative. Yeah. So do you think that most people are simply lazy and they're just virtue signaling or do you truly believe that there is this sort of global conspiracy to try to re redistribute income but first of all i think a little bit bored of that yeah. uh, there's no global conspiracy on climate change there's a global uh, pact on climate change the paris agreement right. and the paris agreement it is uh, an agreement that the goal is to transfer wealth from the Western countries to uh, developed countries. Uh, it is the goal of the Paris Agreement. Actually, the federal government under Trudeau will, send, will give $2.3 billion to African countries to fight climate change. Okay. So that's a transfer of wealth from Canadians to African countries. But do you really believe that these African countries will use the money these dictatorship African countries will use the money to fight climate change. So you're saying dictators are not uh, honest people? Well, I'm, I'm saying, you know, <laughs> I, I think they must prove that they're honest. Uh, right. The proof is not on me. Right. So, so, so it's a fact, but also people uh, don't have time. And I understand that, you know, they're, they're, they are looking at politics during, an electoral, uh, during a campaign, and we are starting the campaign a couple of days from now. And I agree, uh, I'm okay with that. So as politician, I must put, put the facts there and they will be able to look at it and judge me and judge our policies and, and they will have they will be able right. to, to choose. But yes, you know, they, they don't have time to look at all the, these details. I'm doing that, and but I'm not trying to, 
to please everybody. I know that there are some people that are saying, okay, Bernie, I don't believe what you're saying. It, I think it's uh, the principal uh, reason of climate change. It is because of human activities on, on this planet. So uh, it's okay, you know, but at the end, just look at what I'm seeing. And I think right. that's my goal. Let's move next to I, what I think is actually a greater existential threat to Canadian values than climate. And yes, you heard me say that. <laughs> uh, and that is uh, the unrestrained open border immigration <laughs> of folks who don't necessarily, not necessarily, for sure they don't share the cultural values that define the liberties enshrined in Canada. I'm an immigrant myself, yeah. so I don't need to be lectured about the value of an empathetic immigration policy. P some people are truly fleeing very, very desperate situations, as we were as Lebanese Jews in Lebanon, from Lebanon yeah. to here. Yeah. And so I'm forever grateful and loyal to Quebec and Canada for having given me a chance to flourish in this country and to be able to sit one day with a political figure such as yourself, I could have been killed in a ditch somewhere in Lebanon. So I appreciate the value of immigration. Yeah. But what is clear to me, to me, and I've probably been saying this, if I may say, probably <laughs> much longer than you have, uh, what is certainly not rational is to think that you can import cultural baggage of folks who will score in their country somewhere between 99 to 99 percent anti-Semitism, anti-homophobia. Yeah. If you love LGBT rights, then some of the folks that are coming from those countries are not exactly LGBT allies. Yeah. Uh, and so how can we have a conversation where we say, of course we're a country of immigrants. Of course yeah. we want to let in great people from all over the world to enrich our society. But wait a second, we're also able to say people who come from these cultures might not have the same affinities as those that come from these. How can we have that conversation without immediately being tarred as Nazis? Uh, first of all, you must have the courage to have the discussion. A and, uh, you know, I'm doing that because, you know, I want our country to be like that in 25 years. I think that's important. And you came in this country, uh, Gab, yeah, because to share our Canadian values, our Western civilization values, a and that's great. But this country has been built by Francophone, Anglophone, First Nation, and immigrants coming from different parts of the world, and that's okay. But on their an immigration system that is that was a sustainable a point system for example if you speak english or french you had more points and so that was the success of our country but now what's happening right now with the liberals government and the trudeau government trudeau and justin trudeau said you know this country has no core identity and no national identity we are a post national uh, nation so 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 that's not true we have a core national identity, and we must be proud of that. Uh, so what I don't like with our immigration system right now, yes, it is a mass immigration. Uh, I'm not against immigrants. Uh, I'm proud of our country, and people like you build this country with us. But right now, with 350,000 newcomers a year, after three years, you'll have a million people. And as you know, in Canada, we're 36 million uh, people. So a million every three years, I think it is not sustainable. And right now, we don't do any uh, interviews with these people. We did that in the past. So what, and actually, uh, the big majority of uh, these immigrants right now are not economic immigrants, right. and only 26% of them. So our immigration policy must be there to fulfill our economic needs in our country. But that's not the case actually right now. So that's why we want fewer immigrants, a maximum of 150,000 a year. Uh, we want to be able to do interview with each of them and asking them questions about their values. What Do they share our Canadian values and Western civilization values? Uh, that that would be important. But do you think, excuse me for interrupting, yeah, but no. do, do you think that it won't be easy for prospective immigrants to game the system by answering whatever they think you, you I mean, it's, it's, we, we don't yet have a scientific machine that yeah. measures what's in your heart and in your mind truly. Yeah. We have fMRI, but it measures my neural activity. Yeah. It doesn't <laughs> measure whether I really want to kill all Jews. Yeah. Uh, so any test that you come up with at the border that tries to measure whether my values yeah. are in line with yeah. Canadian values, I could easily lie on it. So yeah. how can how can we truly uh, 
uh, gamble yeah. the future of Canada based on these types of vetting procedures. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Actually, we must have an interview first. And right now, I think uh, 20% of them didn't have an interview. So right. that would be a plus, to have the interview. Second, to ask the the right questions. That would be important. But yes, you're right. These people can lie, for sure. Uh, but we must have that. We must do our best to be sure that we select people that will share our values. And we can make some mistake, and, and uh, that's normal. But I think doing that, it will be safer than not doing any interviews. But the most important, if we have more economic immigrants, if we are, if 50 percent of them are economic immigrants, right. that's our goal. That person will come here with a job, and it is easier for that person to integrate our society when you have a job, and they will participate in our society. So, yes, it is a big challenge. I agree with you, and, and they can lie, but at least. <laughs> at least we will something have, is better than nothing yes yeah, something is better than nothing right. and, 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 and we need to have also fewer refugees right now we receive more refugees than the u.s right and and we also love the isis fighters who killed the yazidi more than the yazidi <laughs> i mean you know in in which world can one come up with a moral compass where defending staunchly the most brutal maniacs yeah carries more moral value than the ones whom they fled, the ones who were victimized by them. Yeah. How, do you, how do you explain this kind of parasitic moral compass? I think you can explain that better than myself. <laughs> Probably I can. Yeah. My next book. But, yeah. <laughs> so I will read it yes, for please. sure. Yes. Uh, yes, you're right. It's What's happening right now with our immigration policy, it is not sustainable for the future of our country. And that's why we need to have the discussion about refugees. Yes, we must help these minorities in countries that where their life is in danger. And actually, it is not fair right now. These people who are crossing our border in Quebec illegally at the Roxham Road, their life is not in danger in the state, in New York or, or, or in the U.S. They are not real refugees. And I'm not, I'm not the only one who's saying that. The Department of Immigration said that 40% of them will have to be deported because they're not real refugees. So if you want to be generous, let's help the real refugees. And that's a cost. 45,000 of them for the last two years crossed illegally our border in Quebec. And the cost for our society is $350 million. So we must Our society meaning Quebec or Canada? Canada, okay. $350 million. So we must solve that, and we will. But at the same time, helping fewer refugees, we cannot save the world, and we must be honest about that. We receive, like I said, more refugees, absolute number, than the U.S., 10 times bigger than us. So let's help the real refugees that are waiting in a refugees camp and, and where some minorities in other countries that their life are really in danger because of their values. So that must be the goal of our immigration policy. And we can do it. We did that in the past. Right. So right now with Trudeau, it is a mass immigration. We are opening our borders to everybody and and we are opening our borders to fake refugees. Right. And that's not that's not fair. And I think uh, so on that along those lines, the political ideology of multiculturalism, which is to be differentiated from the colloquial use of, when, when you say, oh, Concordia University is a multicultural school, that simply means that it is represented by many different ethnicities and races. Yeah. That's nice. That's it, perfect. It, right. But the political ideology of yeah. multiculturalism, as originally instituted by the father of our current prime yeah. minister, is something that you take exception to. Absolutely. Maybe you could tell us a bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know. This country, yes, is a diverse country, and, and that's okay. But I don't think it's the role, it is not the role of the state, of the government, to celebrate the diversity. And I'll give you an example. If you're a, uh, a Canadian from Chinese origin and you want to celebrate the Chinese year, you can do it. Uh, you know, I believe in freedom. You can do what you want in, in our country. But we must not use government money to help you to celebrate uh, uh, the Chinese year. We must use government money to celebrate what unite us. And when Justin Trudeau is saying that uh, uh, diversity is our strength, uh, I'm saying the opposite. It's what unite us with our strength. And that's why we don't need a multiculturalist, multiculturalist uh, act uh, in, in this country. We want to abolish that, to repeal that. And we, we don't need the government to finance it. Uh, mult multiculturalism, it is natural. You don't need the government to impose it. And now the government is 
imposing that and, and spending money to promote it. I want our government to promote our history, to promote our culture, to promote who you all are, to promote what unite us. That must be the role of the federal government. So let me let me now put on my hat of the idiotic professor, not yeah. myself, yeah. but I'm representing academia. Yeah. And they will say, but uh, Mr. Bernier, you are now engaging in cultural hegemony. You're engaging in cultural imperialism, colonialism. You have to let people come in and celebrate their unique cultures without trying to impose an assimilation ethos on them. What would you answer to that? I'm going to answer all culture are not equal. All All culture are not equal. And and it's a privilege to be Canadians. Uh, That's important. So so, uh, I'm telling them uh, why the government want to impose to Canadians uh, the celebration of multiculturalism. Uh, Why? You know, it's a political choice. And my political choice is to not impose, is to celebrate because Canada has uh, uh, an identity and and we must celebrate that. We're a nation. uh, We're a nation different than other nations. And that's important. So I don't try to impose. I believe in freedom. I believe in free markets, freedom of speech uh, uh, and freedom. So you are free to do what you want in our country. But I don't want the government to use the people's money, the taxpayers' money, to promote uh, an, uh, a religion or faith or, or to promote a, 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 a cultural identity. Uh, right. we, mu- we must promote what unites us. And, uh, and, you know, for me as a politician, politician it's important to, to preserve this country like that. You know, I'm looking in the future. That's why we need to have the discussion right now. I'm looking what's happening in Europe. When you have no go zone, yeah. no go zone, you know, you cannot go in a zone in, in France or because it's too dangerous. I don't want that in our country. You know, I maybe about 10 years ago, I can't remember exactly when, I first started discussing no go zones and the kind of acrimony I would receive some some idiotic progressives was just astonishing. And this is how I came up with the idea of what I call ostrich parasitic syndrome, right? Yeah. The uh, the metaphor of the ostrich that buries its head and says, I don't want to see reality, yeah. right? And it's parasitic because it's really parasitizing your brain. People simply don't wish to accept that which is before their eyes. So it didn't matter how much evidence I showed them that there were such a thing as no-go zones. Yeah. No, I was a bigot for saying that there was such such a thing as no-go zones. I had on my show a guy who was who's an ex-Muslim, so he certainly yeah. knows the culture, yeah. uh, Ra- uh, Rahim Qasim. Yeah. He's a British gentleman uh, who uh, wrote a book on no-go zones <laughs> where he actually went. I mean, try to go in Malmo, Sweden right now and wear a Star of David and see what happens to you. Try to go to many areas in France. Go to Marseille or Nice yeah. Yeah. and wear a big Star of David and then come back to me and tell me that there are no-go zones. So how do we get people to see reality before their eyes? Well, you're doing that, and you right. started that a long time ago, right. and, and, and I want to congratulate you. Thank you. We need more people like you, but having that discussion. Right. You know, uh, we have the right ideas based on freedom and personal responsibility. That's the foundation of the Western civilization, and, I, and we need to speak about that. You're doing that. I'm doing that. The more we speak... We'll have more people on our side. We need to be out there. And, and, you know, I I believe that we have the right ideas. But I believe that we have the right ideas at the right time. I think people are open to that. Look at some populist movement in Europe. They're they're, they're pushing their politicians to do something about it. Uh, And here in Canada, I think our political party, it is a political party from coast to coast. But also it is a kind of a political movement. Uh, People appreciate our authenticity and the fact that we are ready to discuss every subject. There's no taboo subject for us. And and that's important to discuss subject and like immigration when the other traditional political parties won't go there because they're too afraid of the reaction from the mainstream media. Uh, but I think it's too important. We need to have that discussion. A- a- and, and you're right. There's no go zone, and I don't want that in other countries, and we don't want that in our country. Uh, by the way, in Montreal, we're starting to get the feel of some no-go zones. Uh, I want to make this point that my, my guests, my, my viewers have probably heard me say this before, but you may have not heard yeah. me say this before. I'm Jewish, therefore yeah. I'm no friend of the Nazis. Yeah. My people <laughs> have been almost exterminated during the Holocaust, yet I support the right 
of Holocaust deniers yeah. to go on a campus to debate whether the Holocaust happened, right? Yeah. There is no greater context of something that is offensive. You're taking about a, a, a situation, an event, yeah. where a peoples were going to be exterminated on, uh, on mass scale, yeah, yeah, totally. right? And yet I, as a member of that, those people, yeah. still feel that freedom of speech supersedes anything else so that I support the right of the most vile people, Holocaust deniers, to yeah. speak. So it really frustrates me when then someone comes along and posts on my Twitter good, feed. Good for you on that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Someone posts on my Twitter feed, how could you be speaking to the science denier who doesn't accept climate change? No. Yeah. In a free society, yeah. we debate everything. Absolutely. Even in cases that are as clear. Uh, the Holocaust happening or not yeah. is a lot clearer than climate <laughs> debates. And yet I support the right of those idiots of speaking. Yeah. So this is to all the idiots who write to me on, <laughs> on, on Twitter. Let's move on. But, to, but, but you're yeah. right. Free speech is so important. And, and when you have debates like that, if it is good for the society. Uh, and you like it or not, if you have the right ideas, and you debate, at the end you will win. Maybe not the first time, maybe not the second time, but you will end to win your debate because I think it, 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 it's, so, it's so us, our society, who we are, what we believe in, and we must be proud of that. Right. And, and, you know, I, I like to debate. And, you know, it, it, what I'm doing right now as a politician, uh, it can be tough some days. But, you know, I'm there. I think I have the right ideas. Let's have this debate and prove me wrong. Right. Prove me wrong. That's right. what I like. And, and you're absolutely right. We must do that. Beautiful. You mentioned a few minutes ago, diversity is our strength, yeah. strength by our common friend, yeah. Justin Trudeau. <laughs> uh, you may or may not know this, that uh, in the university, yeah. and I think I told you this offline, that if you think in politics, it's tough to be anti-PC. Yeah. Try to wear my hat for a day in academia and speak out against all the progressive stuff. Yeah. Uh, the universities now are completely run by what I call the die religion, diversity inclusion and equity yeah. professorships i mean literally the highest professorships canada research chairs yeah. these are the chaired professorships that are endowed by the canadian government those are the most prestigious professorships yeah. that either try to bring in top scientists to canada yeah. or try to stop top scientists from leaving canada yeah. those are now very much rooted in die principles uh -huh. more than in scientific excellence, right? So if I am transgender, if I am a person of color, if I ovulate, right, my ovulatory status mm -hmm. determines whether I should get this position. Mm -hmm. Of course, Justin Trudeau is a big proponent of that. Absolutely. Under the guise, because he, he, of course, misunderstands, as do most of these folks, the difference between equality of outcomes and equalities of opportunities, right? Uh, how do we reverse this trend and i mean what i suspect that your yeah. position is similar to mine Absolutely. you believe in meritocracy yeah. how are we going to defeat and eradicate the die religion from all of our institutions uh, you're right at the political level and it's happening uh, in the university and it is sad but it's happening also in the government uh, like our canadian forces uh, now you know they are, they have quota uh, I don't believe in quota. Uh, I don't believe in that. You know, you must have the best person and with the best knowledge and the best experience for a job or, or, or to, do, to do the function. So what's happening right now, all that diversity discussion, like you just said, it's happening right now. And we must fight that. Um, you know, people are asking me as a politician, uh, how many women do you have as candidates? And I'm, you know, you must have 50%. I said, I don't have any quota. So if uh, if they want to come, they'll come. If 90% are women, so be it. Yeah, if 90% are men, so be yeah, it. Yeah, that's it. You know, you, you need to not impose any quota. You need to judge people by their quality, by their character. And, and that, that's, that's the basic of our society. If you want to improve uh, the, 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 the society and, and, and being the best university or the best corporation, and it's happening also in the corporate world, uh, you need to have the best one. And if they're 99% men, too bad. If they're 91% 91, 91 women, too bad. You know, and, and, and that's, that would be our, our strength, having the, the best people for the best position. Well, in sports, and in a second I'm going to yeah. uh, move on to another topic yeah. of sport, transgender folks in sports. Oh, yeah. It's unfair. It's unfair. Right. We'll talk about that in a yeah. second. But in sports, 
people don't seem to be as parasitized by the Thai religion. So, for example, if and actually I looked at this for for my forthcoming book, out of the top t- 25 all-time leading rushers yeah. in the NFL, yeah. 24 seem to come from one race. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, there's only one white guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why is it that we have to have? But why do we have to pray at the altar of the Thai religion when it comes to the top professors, mm. but we don't pray at the altar of the Thai religion when it comes to why aren't there more transgender runners in the NFL? <laughs> why aren't there more white folks? Not a single Vietnamese top yeah. rusher. Yeah. I want more Vietnamese representation. Yeah. What about Lebanese Jews? Yeah. I'm not seeing myself <laughs> in the top, right? What about in the NBA? What about in, in soccer and foot, in real yeah. football? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. in soccer. Yeah, real football. In real yeah. football. Yeah. There's... Out of, since the history of the World Cup, there's only been eight countries that have won it. That's not fair to Namibia. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's not fair to Japan. Yeah. Why hasn't Algeria won it? That's Islamophobic. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, what is it that causes people to, in my view, as someone who studies human behavior, yeah, yeah. I'm completely baffled, to be this idiotic? How do you explain this as a politician? Uh, that's the... That's what happened in our university the last uh, 40 years. Right. And now these people that were, that were students at that time, now they are teaching uh, young people. And the majority of them, uh, I don't know why they believe in diversity like that without looking at the competence of, of these people. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a professor. It's very hard to explain that. But actually, I'm looking at what's happening right now in our society. And as a politician... I'm reacting to that right. with our policy. You're, you're getting the downstream effect. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I like sport. And you're right. I like football. And I'm looking at football. And all my heroes are black uh, American. Uh, the running back, the Cam Newton, the right. quarterback for uh, uh, Carolina. Uh, uh, you know, because they're good. Not because they're black. Right. Because they're good. Right. You, do you know who's the one white guy, by the way? Uh, Russia. Uh, no, uh, out of the you, top 25, yeah, one, yeah. John Riggins. Oh, yeah, John Riggins. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's the only white guy out of the top 25. I, I, I haven't checked it recently, but I think until recently he was still in the top 25. Yeah. Uh, and he had a great career also. Uh, he did. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So continuing with sports, yeah. but going to the transgender issue, I had the distinct honor, but also distinct displeasure of appearing in front of the Canadian Senate in 2017 uh, to comment, to testify regarding Bill C-16, the transgender yeah. bill, where, of course, I repeated that, of course, I'm for transgender rights, like I'm for the rights for every individual, but that there are certain downstream effects of some of the issues that would be involved with yeah. celebrating gender identity and so on and, and rooting it in science rather than in what I call unicornia, yeah. right? Uh, that has led to the following a guy is 260 pounds, he's six foot four, he decides that he self-identifies as a woman, he becomes immediately a she, that by definition is now a woman, and then he can enter into the MMA uh, yeah. octagon or a f- football match, and she is absolutely the same as any other woman. This is insane, right? And this is unfair. And it is unfair because what you're doing is you're saying that the individual right of this one person yeah. to have their unique personhood celebrated supersedes the right of all the female competitors. That is effectively what you're saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're right why don't that. the feminists and the, uh, Justin Trudeau, the king of yeah. the feminists, yeah. why don't they recognize that? How could you be pro-woman and yet from this side of the mouth say I'm pro-woman and from this side say, well, if it's a six foot four uh, person who has a nine inch penis and is called a woman, he's a woman. Why? Uh, I think because it's too evident that uh, if they recognize that, all their ideology will, will, go, crumble. Down, will go down and it will crumble. So, so they, they don't want to see that. They don't want to have any debate about it because if we, if we have a debate, with these people, we're going to win the debate. Right. It's, it's the, the common sense, and people understand the common sense. Uh, and it, when I'm saying it's not fair, it's not fair for all these women who are competing again, against that new woman. So it is unfair. And, and, and I think the more we speak about that, the more we'll have support from, from Canadians on, on, on these issues. When you, when you have private conversations, I'm not asking you to... Yeah to uh, violate the confidentiality of an individual conversation. But in the totality, when you have private conversations with other politicians, 
do most most of them privately support you and say, what the hell is going on with Saudi? Or do they also exhibit the idea pathogens that we've been talking about? Some of them privately would say, Maxim, you're right, but I cannot support you because it's not the policy of our party and I don't have the right to speak about it. Uh, on economic issue, when I'm saying abolishing the cartel in dairy, poultry, and milk, a lot of... Uh, that's a supply management That's stuff. a supply management uh, system. Uh, uh, when I was a conservative, a lot of my uh, former colleagues were saying, you're right, Maxime, but I have too many dairy producers in my writing. I won't win, so I won't speak about that. So they're looking for the short gain instead of speaking about the whole issues and looking forward in the future. A and on that, it's the same thing. I had a discussion with a member of parliament. He said, yeah, it's crazy, but I won't do that because, you know, all the leftist media will be against me. And right. I don't want that. They, they don't want to do that, that battle. Because the risk for them, they judge, they are, they are judging that the risk for them is too high right. uh, to not be elected or to not having good press. So, so they won't speak. But, you know, some people are, they know privately. But also, you know, the, 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 the political parties and the party line, it's very important. And so they have to follow that. We at the People's Party, we are, we are asking our candidates to support our core values and our policies. But it, if they have another issue that they want to speak about it, it's OK. Right. You know, they're a free You're person. giving them a greater marge de manoeuvre. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, in, in academia, we also have, in a sense, a party line. Yeah. The, the party line is not defined by a political position, but it's defined by sort of a grand leftist progressivism. <laughs> And if you go against it, for example, as I do, there is a real price to pay. And the, the real price is that you are ostracized. Yeah. Uh, I mean, because people often write to me and say, but, but I mean, you're tenured, so you're protected. But tenure doesn't protect me from the 100 death threats I receive. Yeah. Tenure doesn't protect me from the fact that my university is actually not very happy. I mean, the, with all due respect and yeah. all due modesty, they should be celebrating that they have someone like me yeah. in their ranks. And in the bizarro world that we live in, they view me as a liability because I speak my mind, because I support true freedom, true liberal values. And you have the courage of your conviction. And you have the courage of your conviction. The reason why I had asked you whether they privately say they, yeah. they support you is because my personal experience in academia yeah. is, that, is that I receive hundreds, if not thousands of emails and letters from professors and students who say, you are my bridge to sanity. Yeah. Thank you for what you do and for saying what we all believe. But shh, please don't tell anybody that I support you. That's the problem. How can we get people, whether it be in your arena, yeah, which yeah. is politics, or in my arena, yeah. academia, to actually, forgive the term, grow a pair, grow a pair of yeah. testicles, yeah. develop the, the, for, the, the, the fortitude, the courage to actually live your conviction? How can we do that? Well, actually, it's a good news. It's a good news because there are some people that won't speak about it, but deep inside, they, they are it. telling you that you are right. So the more we will speak, you, me, and other people, the more we'll be out there, it will help them. It will give them courage to speak. And we just have to continue to do what we're doing. And with your, with your channel and what you're doing right now, that's helping everybody to have the courage to speak. And a day, you'll have more people that will speak and will win the battle. We will win the battle of ideas. So it's really a domino effect. It's you gotta you gotta yeah, trigger you, the thing. You're and then the first off. one. You're the first one. You Thank started. You. When did you start your, your many years ago? Many years ago, yeah. you were the first one. Now you started before Jordan Peterson. Right. So you, Jordan Peterson, and other people, and people are listening. Right. People are fed up with the traditional media, and and, and they are listening. They, we are, and you are the alternative, and they're looking at you. And so yes, you started. You were maybe alone and now there's more people speaking about it and, and that's great that people are coming to you you know you're right but i don't want i don't want to speak about it because they want to have their quiet life right. and, and you know I, i'm in front of the media every day you're in front of the media also there's you know uh, you know i'm a human i want everybody it would be, that would be great if everybody liked you like me <laughs> and loved me i'm a politician and having more votes and that would be great right. but that's not the reality i don't try to please everybody i know that saying something like that and, and, and putting my values, values and principle on the table, I will have people against me like you. Right. That's happening to you. But at least we are out there. And, right. and, and that's why freedom will win at the end. So speaking about being out there, what's going on with you trying to get in 
on the debates. Let's talk about that because yes. that's that's what's going to allow your voice to be heard. Absolutely, that's so important for us because it's our big challenge right now. Uh, a lot of people don't know that we exist. They don't know that we exist. 52% of Canadians are saying that they're ready to vote for a new political party in Canada. But 52 of them or 50 of them don't know that we exist. We just need to be out there and to speak. And the more we speak, and I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to be with you, the more we speak, we have we will have 338 candidates all across the country. They will debate with the, with the, uh, the Liberals and all the other candidates from the other political parties. And so... That, that's important. But the most important, it's for us to be at the national debates. The what needs to happen for that to happen? So I'm very pleased because we right now we are doing a petition and we have more than 30,000 signatures on that petition. Uh, and the, the last step will be we had a decision, a primary decision by Mr. Johnston. He is the commissioner of the uh, in charge of the debates, the, the two national debates, one in French, one in English. And uh, the final decision will be the September the 16th, a couple of days from now. But what I appreciate, a lot of my opponent uh, are saying, you know, it would be good if Maxim is there. Uh, some also uh, commentators are saying, you know, we may not like what Maxim is saying, but he must be there. And, and one of the criteria that uh, the commissioner must look at is the recent political context. And that's important. And when you look at it, what's happening in Canada with the growth of our party from zero to 40,000 members, from zero organization across the country to 338 and organizations. And in a short period, in, in a year. In 11 months, yeah. yeah. So something is happening. But I think at the end, the commissioner will allow us to be part of that. And that would be great because that would be a real debate. That would be a real English and French debate um, because we have policies that are very different. We spoke about the immigration policy. All the other political parties want, want more immigration. Uh, balancing the budget in two years, being responsible. We were the only party to speak about that. Um, against political correctness, Correct. we're the only one. Uh, for free speech, we're the only one. Uh, so, so that would be a real debate. And... I'm pretty optimistic that at the end I'll be there. And that would be good for a party because people will be able to to look at our, our, our platform and to look at these debate that we'll have with other leaders. And at the end, I'm pretty optimistic that we, it will help our movement, it will help our party, and we'll see what will happen the 21st of October. So what do you think of the following two statements that I've heard some of my people in my personal circle say? Number one, we love Maxime but he's going to split the vote. <laughs> Number two, we love Maxime, and if I vote for him, I'm burning my vote because he's not going to get anywhere, certainly not in this yeah, cycle. Yeah. So, yes, it's a good first start, but I've, I have to make my vote count for something. I vote for him, I'm giving it away. What do you think about these two sort of related topics? First of all, first of, uh, I'm asking them to vote for their values, to vote for the, what they believe in, uh, and, and look at our platform. Uh, and don't vote against something. Vote for something. And so th that's our position on that. But speaking about splitting the votes, we are not splitting the votes. Who's splitting the vote right now? Andrew Scheer, now the Conservative Party of Canada, under the leadership of Andrew Scheer, it's a centrist party, and Andrew Scheer said that. His goal is to split the vote with the Liberal, and he's doing that. He's doing from center to the right to center left. And so I'm telling people, maybe Maxime Bernier won't be prime minister the 22nd of October, but we can have the balance of power. And if we have, and I think we'll have maybe a minority government, can be a minority people's party, a minority liberal, a minority conservative, but we can have the balance of power. I'm looking what happened in BC. There's an NDP government there and three Greens, three uh, members of parliament uh, from the Legislative Assembly are controlling the government. They have the balance of power. I can tell you that we will elect more than three candidates and we can have the balance of power. And if we have the balance of power, we will be the principal alternative. We, will want, we won't do any compromise with our policies. The minority government will have to come to us for having some support and will be able to push for a balanced budget, to push for uh, uh, changing our immigration system with a more sustainable immigration policy. So we will be honest with our 
policies and our principles and, 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 and people who voted for us. So they, we can have the balance of power. So doing that, that will help them because I don't believe that if you vote for Andrew Scheer or Justin Trudeau, that's the same for me. The same on balancing the budget, the same on immigration, the same on foreign aid, the same of, on uh, corporate welfare, giving money to corporation. And we can be, uh, we can save $5 billion there and having a flat tax on business that would be fair for everybody. So I'm asking people to look at our policies and they are different, but the liberals and the conservative on the most important issues for our country are the same. So if you vote for us, you'll be sure that we'll push your ideas and, and, and that minority government will be in a position to take some of our ideas some of our policies to stay in government. Very nice. Uh, any last? Oh, before before I ask you any last words, uh, there may be. I'm, I'm going to try to channel now my Godfather uh, <laughs> persona. Yeah. There may be a day in the future where I come to you if yeah. you ever become yeah. Prime Minister of yeah. Canada, asking for an ambassadorship. And I trust when I ask to be ambassador <laughs> of Turks and Caicos you will oblige, correct? <laughs> You're on record. Yeah, so I'm on record. And, uh, you know, I don't try to pander to everybody. So I won't pander to you. Ah, but, very good. But I will, I will tell you that you'll be on the list. Okay. And I will look at the list and I will judge people by their competence. And I think you are a very competent person. Well, aren't you sweet? Uh, Maxime, it is such a pleasure to meet you. I wish you the best of luck in your uh, journey. And I wish that you will get a chance to speak at it. And if you don't, I'll even set it up so that you're in a bigger platform. I'll try to see if I can get you on Joe Rogan, my good friend. That would be great. And I want to thank you, Gab, for this opportunity. It's always important. And it's an honor to me to be with you and you to have much. that opportunity to have that discussion. The feeling is reciprocal. Thank you very much, yes, Maxime. Hi, everybody. I hope that you enjoyed my chat with uh, Maxime Bernier. Uh, I also hope that you will consider supporting this channel. Uh, in one of several ways. You can certainly uh, post comments, you can share it with your friends, but I also count on my viewers to recognize the fact that it takes a lot of time and effort and many professional and personal risks to do what I do. And so with that in mind, I hope that you'll consider supporting me either through my PayPal account, my Patreon account, my Subscribestar account. I also have a Teespring account for purchasing merchandise. So there's a lot of ways by which you can uh, help to monetize my time and my risk for doing what I do. Uh, I think you'll agree that it's a fair exchange that uh, I take the time to do what I do and I don't have to be doing what I'm doing. I do it because I believe in all of the values that you often hear me speaking of, uh, about. But I do do it at great personal, economic and professional costs. So please consider supporting this channel so that I can keep doing what I'm doing uh, free of some of the threats that otherwise are always looming. Thank you very much, and I truly appreciate your support. Cheers.